It has been the biggest outbreak of mass street protests since the late 1990s. Starting last fall, Occupy Wall Street demonstrations exploded in more than 350 cities and involved tens of thousands. Ugly scenes like these have dominated the media. But they don't represent the entire picture. The fact is, most of the demonstrations ended peacefully. Some experts say this proves that police have learned some important lessons about how to balance our democratic right of dissent with the equally important need to maintain public order. Is this true? I'm Steve Handelman. To help us explore that question, we are privileged to have as our first guest, Bill Bratton, former police commissioner in New York City and former chief in Los Angeles. His ideas about 21st century policing have inspired a new generation of senior cops around the country. He's currently chairman of Kroll, the international security firm, where he continues to spread the message to police leaders around the world. Bill, welcome to Criminal Justice Matters. Great to be with you. I can't think of anybody in a better position to talk about how policing has changed in response to mass protests than you with the jobs you've had and the cross-country experience you've had. You mentioned recently uh, that you see a sea change in how law enforcement is responding to public protests or mass protests. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Well, I think we've gone through a great maturation process over the last 40 years that I can speak to. I can remember policing the anti-war protests against the Vietnam War in 1970, fresh out of the Boston Police Academy after six weeks of training with my helmet and my 24-inch baton, and that was the extent of the equipment that we had. Uh, the sea change is that uh, we approach demonstrations uh, in a much more informed way now, that we really try to work with the protesters. We try to uh, focus a lot on both public safety, officer safety, demonstrator safety. Uh, I think that we tend to be, we're prepared to be spontaneous, but we try to not to have to engage in spontaneity. We like to really try to work these things out, plan them with the demonstrators. And even civil disobedience, where they will consciously seek to break the law, you try to even cooperate and coordinate and collaborate with them uh, when they seek to engage in civil disobedience, where they want to be arrested, for example. So that uh, the sea change is the idea to ensure civil liberties, ensure the constitutional right to demonstrate, ensure the constitutional rights of free speech, but to also do it in a way that uh, police don't get drawn into a situation where we are sometimes uh, consciously uh, provoked, if you will, by some elements of the various demonstration movements to try and uh, embarrass policing as well as to attract a lot of media attention and to uh, embarrass us in the sense of uh, provoking us into actions which uh, in hindsight should not have been taken. Long-winded answer to that first question, no, no, sorry about that. Uh, and I want to get into that with you a little bit more in depth, but um, clearly if there is a sea change, uh, in some of the cities where there's been Occupy Wall Street protests, that hasn't seemed to have taken. And we've seen the pictures which have gone viral on YouTube and television where there have been scenes that are really reminiscent of the 60s, 70s, even the 90s with the World Trade Center protests, the World Trade protests, sorry. Um, are those row cops? Is that a row? Is that did something go wrong in the communication? Or? No, I think the instances we're seeing uh, of police inappropriate use of force, whether it be uh, individually or in a group environment, most of what we're seeing tends to have been individual. We don't see a repeat of the uh, Chicago Democratic National Convention, mm -hmm. the uh, the police riot that occurred there, where literally the whole department was out of control. No, uh, we're seeing individual uh, uh, activities on the part of individual officers or small groups of officers. Some of the sea change that I've referred to is the uh, impact of social media, the idea of um, the spontaneity with which uh, incidents can occur and, and basically grow exponentially so rapidly. Uh, the British police just had that experience this past fall with the riots that they had with multiple cities that the combination of uh, the media, the traditional media, and significantly uh, abetted and aided by social media, everybody with a camera and a, an iPad and an iPod, uh, the ability to attract a lot of people very quickly to an event, 
the police having to stay abreast of that in terms of staying well aware of social media, how to access it themselves. It's uh, requiring police to, uh, in addition to developing new tactics and procedures, to uh, also uh, have the capability to be much more spontaneous in an organized and informed way than they were in the past. Some of the standards that experts, uh, law enforcement experts and criminologists have been talking about are things like more engagement, better communication. But uh, have the standards for the use of force changed at all, and should they change? I mean, is that something that's evolved over the last 20, They're 30 constantly years? evolving. That If you look to the, back to the civil rights era in the 60s in the South, and uh, not even just in the we sector to the South, around the country, use of dogs, use of uh, water hoses, those are things that are no longer used here. Uh, there's still a debate about the use of taser-type devices in a lot of police organizations. Uh, and debate about uh, potential use of less than lethal, non-lethal projectile types of uh, devices, the rubber bullets, if you will. There is no uniformity uh, in police departments in the United States as to what they authorize, when they authorize it. In all instances, you try to define, to, uh, develop policies and procedures that are within the law. Should there be a uniformity? Should there be some sort of central standard? Uh, you would think that would be the case, but again, we are a country of 50 states, uh, 17 12, to 20,000 municipalities. And, well, even that number, 12,000, I, I, I don't think anybody could actually tell you how many there are. I figure I use, tend to use most uh, often is 17,000, and that uh, we are very different uh, than many other countries around the world with national police forces, England for that matter with 43 or 45, I've been spending a lot of time over there recently. Uh, uh, was over there um, just subsequent to the riots they had. And uh, even there with their national policies, uh, they differ from uh, community to community. I mean, this is a phenomenon that's in a way a little bit different from the 60s protests and even, even the world trade protests of the late 90s. Uh, it borrows obviously from the Arab Spring, the idea that this sort of a leaderless kind of spontaneous approach, you mentioned social media. But one of the big um, changes is in the 60s, there was sort of a cultural gap between protesters and police. They're, 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 on one side were the college students, the other side were police who came from blue collar working class backgrounds for the most part. They weren't talking to each other, they didn't understand each other. We're in a much different situation now, it seems to me, where you have people from a lot of different walks of life, a lot of economic backgrounds, uh, arguing for a, a, a much wider kind of economic change. Uh, that kind of, I would think, changes the, the formula a bit in how law enforcement operates. Um, well, but yet there's at, still that division. Look at where policing was in the 60s uh, when I came into the Boston Police Department in 1970. 2,800 officers, no women. Uh, in a city that was at that time about 30, 35 yes. percent minority. Uh, my class of 155 officers, there were three minorities. No openly gay or transsexual officers. They didn't come out till the 19, late 1980s. So the police who are policing these events uh, have changed, that we look more like the community. The college education levels among many police officers, particularly in large city police forces, uh, many of them uh, are now college educated themselves, and many of them have their own children in college versus in the 60s and 70s, that was not necessarily the case. I was the uh, recipient of a uh, law, federal law enforcement uh, scholarship program to attend college mm. while a police officer. And the intent there was to get the police to effectively uh, be more like the rest of society, better educated, uh, uh, better understanding of all the changes that were occurring. Most police chiefs in America in 1970, everyone in Tibet didn't have college educations, whereas now that's pretty much a standard requirement for yes. a police chief. And many people call you responsible for a whole new approach to policing, um, and your approach has been picked up by younger middle management law enforcement people around the country who are putting that into action, not just with Comstat, but in a whole approach to law enforcement and public order and public safety. But yet, in, in many ways, um, with all the best interests in mind, we've also, we're also under a different cloud now, post-2011. Uh, the, the, that seems to have changed 
whether we like it or not, how police do go about Explain their jobs. that, uh, basically that comment, if you wouldn't mind, Steve, the, uh, the, the idea that the different cloud, the post-2011 cloud. Police uh, um, seem to be thinking, or think they have to think more about general security questions. I mean, they, in any public pro pro public protest, you might have to worry about a terrorist Oh, sure, that, uh, the issue of the post-9-11, I'm sorry, I thought you said post-2011. Uh, uh, post-9-11, no, I meant. 9-11 changed an awful lot, uh, uh, for uh, changed so much in policing that uh, I came back into policing post-9-11. It's the LAPD, it had been out of it for six years, and uh, the world had changed dramatically in policing in many good ways, that our ability to acquire information, make intelligence out of it, our technical capabilities, our uh, makeup. Uh, we uh, look differently than we did yeah. as recently as 2001 in the sense of the numbers of minorities and women in, in police departments. Uh, we are always going to be uh, a profession uh, that is changing moving forward. I'm pleased to have been part of, when I was in the business, uh, part of what I would describe as the progressive transformational movement of police leaders, uh, leaders who uh, were members of the Police Executive Research Forum, who read the papers that the Police Foundation published, who uh, were maybe more enlightened than our profession was back in the 70s and 80s. And in fact, uh, uh, some of our enlightenment came about seeing many of the abuses that we were exposed to as policemen way back when. But has 9-11 made it a little bit harder to give the kind of space to public protest uh, and public dissent that we could look back on before uh, 2001? Uh, yes and no, that there is the concern always in public gatherings now, the, the specter of potential terrorist activities uh, uh, in large gatherings. But uh, the world we're in now, we, only 10 years after 9-11, is that the information available to police, the information available to anybody in today's world is so different than it was even only 10 years ago. And that factors into how police, uh, uh, police demonstrations. We are much better trained, much better educated, much better informed. I think our crowd management, crowd control tactics, our incident command systems in the sense of how we coordinate with other police agencies, with fire departments, for example, in criminal matters versus natural disasters or even in public demonstrations. The uh, policing world has changed so dramatically, all for the better, but there is always going to be in policing the potential for an individual, a group of individuals, uh, a larger group of individuals to get out of control. I had that issue in um, my city, Los Angeles, back in uh, 2007 with the May Day uh, uh, immigration rally Mac in MacArthur, MacArthur Park, Park, in which uh, a large number of our officers engaged in uh, what we deemed to be inappropriate use of force and, and inappropriate and, in fact, almost uh, illegal uh, dispersal of a crowd that had a permit to be in a public park for peaceful purposes and uh, with poor leadership on the scene. A lot of our officers behaved appropriately within our guidelines and standards and with the leadership that was with them at that point in time. But uh, subsequent review found that uh, there was widespread failure of command, leadership, as well as appropriate use of force. So subsequent to that event in LA, we made a lot of changes. And that's the good news about policing today. It's willing to admit its mistakes. We owned up to the fact that that thing was not uh, a good time for the LAPD or the city of LA uh, and made a lot of changes that uh, years ago we would not have been willing to talk about it, we would not have been willing to have transparent investigations. And that's something I think by and large we're seeing with the events around the uh, Wall Street movement. The events, by the way, by tend to be, uh, the investigations uh, tending to be conducted in a very public, transparent way that uh, uh, as we go about it. And that's what the sea change has also been. So when things go wrong, the heads need to roll? Uh, sometimes heads do need to roll because they make either a conscious decision to take an action that's in violation of procedures, protocols, the law. Uh, when those types of mistakes are made, they, they require a punishment that may in fact uh, require heads to roll. Oftentimes it's the idea of uh, a mistake. a mistake was made retraining, possibly punishment, but punishment's usually for a conscious violation. And uh, 
you've seen, I think, in some of the instances around the country where there was culpability on the part of the police that action has been taken against them. A number of those cases are still pending, so what will be the ultimate outcome? We'll have to wait and see. How important of a challenge do you think this is to policing in the next 10 or 15 years? If you were talking oh, it is always the tension that police deal with that one of the most difficult areas for our police is the uh, controlling, the management of crowd situations, demonstration situations, particularly those situations that uh, um, involve civil liberties issues, freedom of speech, uh, issues that are, are demonstrations that are controversial by their nature. And uh, also, unfortunately, that from time to time there's an element, a criminal element, there's a uh, uh, groups of people who exist to really, uh, they are anarchists, that uh, they, 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 they want to stir a ferment, they want to stir a controversy, they want to take on the police for a variety of ways. And in this social media era we live in, it's so easy for uh, police to get baited or for police making a mistake or when there's an intentional act of a policeman that is a violation or a criminal act to be magnified to, uh, what's the expression, uh, to go viral? Go viral. Uh, go viral, that, you know, how many times a day do you hear that, that uh, it's got 600,000 Twitters or it's got 700,000 hits? And uh, so the actions of police today, that if a photographer was not there to take it, take the picture, uh, trying to investigate it was very difficult. Now today, it's more likely, it's more likely that the picture's gonna be taken because everybody has the capability to do that on a moment's notice. Bill, thanks very much. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. Many of you may know that John Jay College was founded in the 1960s to promote the principles of responsible policing in a democracy. That remains a core mission. And there's no better place to explore the issue of how police responded to the OWS protests. Eugene O'Donnell teaches law and police science at John Jay. He's a former NYPD officer and a frequent commentator on police issues. Joining him is Batabale Mtombeni of the Nonviolent Communications Working Group at the OWS encampment in Zuccotti Park. She received her law degree from Columbia University and now runs a private consultancy in conflict management. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Batabale, let me start with you. Take us over to the OWS encampment in Zuccotti Park and give us a sense of what it was like in the months and the weeks before uh, everything came down with the, uh, with the police moving in? Well, I remember very well the first time I went to the park. It was sort of as a tourist. I'd heard that folks were there. I think it was about two or three weeks in. And I remember just being totally overwhelmed by the spirit uh, and the energy that was there. People were really happy. They were excited. There was movement. Uh, you know, people had their signs up, they were talking to each other, and there was a real sense of uh, hope as well as, uh, uh, you know, the relief that finally something was happening and people were getting together to talk. And were you there when the police finally moved in? I wasn't there when the police uh, finally moved in. I wasn't there that night. Uh, I woke up in the morning to see what was going on uh, and decided that the role that I've played was to be there to comfort, to uh, speak with people and so forth afterwards. So different people played different roles. Some people put themselves out there, direct action, uh, you know, they, they got arrested and so forth, and other people played other roles. What was your impression from talking to the, uh, the people at Zuccotti Park that the, the use of force there, or the, the techniques that were used were excessive? Definitely. In what way? Uh, both in terms of uh, physical and psychological harm and in terms of harm to property. Uh, in a meeting that happened about three days later, people were talking about really feeling traumatized in the way that things had happened. It was really frightening. I got a little bit of a sense of it uh, the next Sunday when I went for the General Assembly. And at that time, the entire park was ringed with uh, barricades and there were police with helmets on. and you know, carrying batons. And I remember standing there looking around me and feeling horribly unsafe. And how ironic that was that um, you know, the police are to protect and to serve. And I felt very unprotected. <laughs> and, and clearly you feel there's another way because that's what you do. Yes. I mean, that, your, your working team um, was there steadily throughout the time of the encampment. 
and you dealt with some of the, the conflicts that were inside the encampment. Tell us about that, how your, the working team worked and what the principles were that it was based on. Well, one thing to understand is that any time you put a number of people, a large number of people together in a small space, things are going to happen. Uh, unfortunate things are going to happen, tempers flare, uh, or you know, issues that folks might have uh, underlying may become exacerbated in that situation. And so understanding this, uh, nonviolent communication uh, folks came to the park and uh, set up a table for empathy so that anybody who table was for feeling... Table like Yes, that. seriously. Uh, we, it, we could all use that. Th yes, <laughs> and it, it was wonderful. And people came from uh, both inside the park and outside the park and took advantage of that. And then mediators got involved and we joined our, our uh, resources and started offering mediation as well. Gene, let me uh, go to you. Um, we just heard from former Chief Bratton about a new approach to policing, a sea change, he calls it, in terms of how police deal with public protests. Now, it's not clear whether that sea change was in evidence at Zuccotti Park. You were at Zuccotti Park. What do you make of uh, the scenes that we've seen at New York and a few other cities around. What accounts for that? I mean, have police changed their approach? Well, I think, this, uh, first, uh, I think it, it's uh, worth commending the working group for what, doing what they did because they made uh, a point to make sure that these issues were, where, they, where there were issues, they were taken care of by the demonstrators and the, and the protesters. And that vitiated the need for the police to be involved. And the less the police are involved, I think, the rule of thumb on this, the better. The less the police have to be hands-on, the more they can be present in case order needs to be restored, but hands off, the better everybody is, including the police. In terms of a new model, I think that there are many different models in different parts of the country based on the politics of the, because it's the politics that drives this. There's no police science to this, uh, really. It, it's mostly a political decision. By politics, you mean the mayor, the city council? City hall, the, 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 the kind of policing you see on the ground is often, not always, but often reflective of what you're seeing at a city hall and the dialogues that are going on there. The police are just essentially taking the orders of the people. I'm, I'm not saying in all cases, but the tone and the tenor, the timing, the decision to, to move the demonstrators in Zuccotti Park, that was a political decision. That was not a police decision. Right, right. But I mean, you, you, you're doing a book, as we just talked about, about humane policing. Um, how does that fit into what we're learning about here, about what happened at Zuccotti Park and a lot of other encampments? Are there lessons to be learned that, that police ought to take to heart? That the police are really just ordinary folks wearing uniforms and that they're not different in any way than the people on the other side of the barricades. It's essentially, they're policing, they're people policing people. And the problems you get, the real bad abuses for police in the police business is when the police forget that, when they start seeing themselves as a force apart or a different breed or some sort of superior group of people. It is a fact that most of the cops are part of the 99%. It is a fact most of the cops are labor members, and it is a fact that most of the cops on the other side of the barricades have their pay and benefits and pensions under massive attack at this point, that they're clinging on to dear life as middle class people. And uh, so it's absurd to suggest that there's some sort of reason why they would not be uh, sensitive to those issues. So you, you think we would see that in evidence in a lot of the, the ways that the demonstrations were handled, but we really didn't. But if I may, sure. you know, there was an understanding of uh, an interesting um, tension, uh, back and forth, support on the one hand, and then the issue of what the police were there to do and the kinds of orders they were following. One of the things that heartened me most was to hear that one of the largest donations for uh, money for food came from the uh, correctional officers union. So, you know, police unions, officers unions actually were helping in the ways that they could that couldn't necessarily be overt. One of the things that I think was uh, made a difference was when the police officers had helmets on or didn't. You mm -hmm. know, if you could see their eyes, if you could see their faces, that humanizing element. And I think that for a lot of the people in the park, there was that understanding, clear understanding, that the folks who were in the uniforms could next week be people who are in the park. You know, who knows when you're going to lose your job? Who knows, uh, you know, when your security uh, is is going to end? So I guess I mean both of you are a lot more optimistic than I would have thought. I mean, they're, well, they're the ru the rub is the rub, of course, occurs if there's violence. If there's violence, right. the public is going to want to know where the police were, and they could turn on a dime. Even in cities that are progressive cities, Berkeley, California, where people are generally supportive of the demonstrators and the movement. 
they do not want to see disorder and they do not want to see windows broken and crowds you know massing down the street so the police have to play this really delicate balancing mm -hmm. act that's why i don't think they have uh, the idea that they have some sort of man uh, some sort of miracle elixir to, they've got some sort of magical cure to this stuff i think it's a day by day minute by minute process i don't think it's it's too early in crowd control and demonstration control Always, it's too early to declare victory that you have it all sorted out. It's a it's a minute to minute process. OWS is certainly going to go on, and we we don't know how it's going to manifest itself in the months to come. But if you're looking at a young police officer out in the streets trying to deal with these things, what would you advise him to think about when they're out at the? Obviously, he's got to listen to his superiors. Well, you, you, you know, the, the, the idea is that hopefully the, hopefully the leadership is leading properly. If the leadership is leading properly, then hopefully he's, he's following uh, orders that are legitimate orders. But the, the real issue for police officers is that the use of force is to be used only when it's absolutely necessary to do that, and then, then sparingly. And that essentially uh, it, the ideal thing is for the police to be passively there, ready to act if necessary, but to facilitate free speech. And one of the things you said, which is correct, um, the police have to make sure, especially in a city like New York, where we have such a, a long history of, of protest and dissent, police have to find the right balance that works for this city, which is to not intimidate protesters, not be unnecessarily kind of chilling the free speech that people are entitled to, but at the same time being ready to move if, uh, if necessary. It, there's an example, if, if I might, um, of exactly what you're talking about. Uh, on that same day when we came back for General Assembly, the Sunday after the Thursday, uh, uh, somebody had a seizure and so it was necessary for paramedics to come in and the police came in with the paramedics and there was one officer there who was barking basically you know, to have everybody stand back and I felt that it contributed to tensions unnecessarily people were standing around because they were concerned they were concerned about the health of this person it's true that they needed space in order to uh, help him and, and carry him out to get the necessary medical care but the attitude you know the, the hands on the uh, on the waist belt and, and sort of walking around and, and so forth wasn't helpful uh, in, in that instance the, the uh, oh, sorry Steve I want to thank you both thank you there's a oh. lot of we can go on this sure. for another program but it's at least there's some encouraging stuff here that Great. we've heard Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Steve. thanks to both of you. Please let us know what you think. You can reach us on Facebook and by email, as well as the numbers listed following this program. See you next month on Criminal Justice Matters.